business environment has been a roller coaster, more so for key stakeholders in the market. Some businesses have been operating on the edge, with many facing the verge of liquidation. So today we want to shape the landscape of our conversation to look at the Insolvency Act, which was enacted in 2015, and we'll have a conversation with the official receiver, Mark Gakuru, who will tell us if the Insolvency Act is really working for Kenyans. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, my name is Mark Gakuru. I'm the official receiver. So the first question will be, how does the government define the Insolvency Act and when does it apply to a company? Um, the Insolvency Act defines insolvency. First, you have to apply the balance sheet in terms of whether the assets are, le um, are less than the liabilities. The second thing is when, if you are not able to uh, pay your debts when they fall due, that is an insolvent position. And how does the Insolvency Act handle the distribution of assets and funds among creditors? We have a criteria which is set. The first criteria is that when you have a secured, uh, when you are a secured creditor, uh, we don't touch your security. More so if the security was uh, created before the insolvency proceedings. Uh, the second criteria is we look at the second schedule of the bank of the uh, of the insolvency act, so that uh, the first thing we look at is the expenses of the insolvency proceedings. These include the liquidation costs. The second thing it includes the cost of filing petition, the lawyers' cost. The second uh, uh, category would be we look at the wages of the workers. The workers are usually paid about six months, which is about uh, under maximum of 200,000. Uh, the second thing, the third thing we look at uh, would be the taxes, uh, income tax, pay, all those statutory deductions, so that that is paid. The third thing now uh, is the unsecured creditors. These are people who have not created any securities. Uh, that is how we divide properties. But if you have a security, then uh, you, are no, you decide whether to elect to be part of the insolvency proceedings or not. First of all, is it true that 98 farms will be liquidated this year? And if so, what is the ripple effect of liquidating these farms? Okay. <coughs> Natasha, I think the bigger problem is this. Uh, I don't know where you got the 98 farms. First, maybe you need to uh, make us understand where you got the 98 farms. Because when you look at our statistics, and you can look at the BRS website, uh, we have statistics even for the last year, 2023. Um, we, had, uh, we had 47 liquidations last year. We had, uh, we had 14 uh, administrations. We had four ad uh, administrative receiverships. So I don't know where the 98 liquidations come from, but you can check, it's in the website. So um, what is the ripple effect of liquidating camps? Um, the first is the loss of jobs for employees, which is, I think, the saddest thing about a liquidation. Uh, of course, the employees support their families, and uh, they also support many uh, parts of our economy in terms of uh, uh, putting cash to, back to the economy. So I think uh, that is one of the major issues. The other issue I think would be uh, an issue of even just uh, the general economy, uh, that uh, we are not creating jobs, we are not creating opportunities for the youth. So I think uh, for me that would be the sad thing about a liquidation. First maybe I would want to state what a liquidation is. Uh, when you get into a liquidation, there are three uh, uh, processes maybe in a company. One is a liquidation, the second is an administration, there's a company voluntary arrangement, and the administrative receivership. Those are the four in the company, in the, in the Insolvency Act. Administration, you are trying to uh, sell a business as a going concern, you are trying to maintain value so that you can get value even after selling the businesses. So it's more a restructuring tool. Um, when you go to administrative receivership, for example, that was a provision from the CAP, CAP uh, 486, uh, part 4, 
of the uh, last act which was amended to uh, Insolvency Act so that the debentures or the securities created prior to uh, 15 September 2015, uh, those securities uh, you cannot uh, use the law retrospectively. So we are using administrative receivers. That part takes care of the debentures or securities created before. Uh, the third is uh, uh, the third is a company voluntary arrangement. But maybe first I go to liquidation. Liquidation, you are basically saying you are exiting the business. You are exiting the market. Basically, this company has reached its end. So for us, what we do, we make sure that we have an orderly way of closing the business. And we have a fair, everyone gets a fair uh, share of the collections which we are able to collect from the businesses. So it's a more equitable way of closure of the business. So that's what we call a liquidation. But in essence, what we are saying that is we are closing the business. Uh, it's basically insolvent or whatever other reason. You know, liquidation, it's not only that a company is insolvent. It can also be an issue of that the company, the shareholders are fighting. Uh, it can be brought by, for example, the AG can petition the court on public interest to close a company. So there are many variables in liquidation, the reasons you can go under liquidation. Uh, when you look at uh, CVA, which is company voluntary arrangement, on the other hand, uh, that is you are saying, I cannot meet my obligations now, but given time, I will be able to do so. So you call your creditors and you sit with them and you tell them that this is what... Uh, uh, this is what I'm planning for the next one year. I need time to pay your debts. And it's a restructuring tool. Uh, sadly, last year I didn't even see a single one. How does the government plan to address the potential disruption of the supply chain by these farm closures? I don't think there are mainly disruptions, and I'll tell you why, Natasha. Um, there are several factors you look at. One, um, the spectrum of the, of the liquidations. For example, if you look at the past years, we've had uh, supermarkets. What happens is one supermarket or two go under over several years, and what happens is the competition just dives in and actually takes uh, care of that. If you look at uh, uh, another aspect would be uh, the issue of, uh, for example, insurance company. Like last year, I think we had Resolution Health. Another insurance will definitely get in and do the job. So I wouldn't say, if you even look at uh, in hospitality, if it's a hotel, they, there are so many other hotels. So I wouldn't put it like a disruption. Mainly, uh, what I would say is that uh, it's just that the businesses have failed, but they are in a wide spectrum of businesses. So I don't think uh, there are many disruptions in terms of value chain. What advice will you give business owners to avoid or navigate the risk of liquidation? I think having sat here for quite a while, I think there are two things I have seen. Uh, causes of, uh, causes of uh, business closures. One is lack of corporate governance. So whoever has uh, a business, I would tell them to invest in corporate governance structures. Uh, the second thing I have seen, which is prevalent also in this market, is fraud. So that uh, you open a business, but you're not planning to pay anyone. So I think for genuine businesses, we are here to assist. And we want to have, even when you take a risk and open a business, that uh, the office of the official receiver will assist you close the business in an orderly fashion. But for fraud, we have offenses under the Act, so we will prosecute you and make sure that uh, you, make, you, you, you pay for the uh, money which you've lost for the investors. As an insolvency practitioner assess the value of assets and liabilities during the liquidation process? Mm, there are ways you can do so. Uh, one is, once a company goes under, there is an, we call for directors to fill in the statement of affairs. The statement of affairs have like an asset column and a liabilities column. 
So we are able to assess whether the assets and the liabilities and we can ascertain that this company will not be able to pay the debts and we are able to ascertain the asset value. Uh, the second uh, way you can ascertain that is the books of accounts. So when you have the books of accounts and we have auditors, even in the office here, we will be able to look at the books and see where, uh, where the assets are. The third is uh, summoning people who have information. For example, former employees. Most of these employees usually have information in terms of uh, what was happening in the business and they will give you this information if we call them. We can also uh, apply to court and uh, summon anyone with information to this regard. My last question, is the Insolvency Act really working for Kenyans? It is working. Uh, it is working. Uh, and I'll tell you this. Uh, before 2015, I think Kenyan, Kenya was ranked above uh, 100 in terms of insolvency, resolving ins insolvency. In fact, uh, when you look at the last ease of doing business, I think it was 2019, we had dropped all the way to number, I think, 51 or 52 um, in terms of only insolvency. So you can see this is around the world. So we are in the, in the first lot of countries which have very good insolvency laws. And I think the World Bank has been there for us to even guide us through the process and to make sure that we, 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 we actualize and uh, manage uh, to have a regime which works. To the world of stocks, the market closed the week on a bullish note with the Nairobi Securities Exchange All Share Index gaining 0.6%. The Nairobi Securities Exchange 10 Share Index gained 0.4%. The Nairobi Securities Exchange 20 Share Index gained 0.2%. And the Nairobi Securities Exchange 25 Share Index gained 0.5%. The trading activity in the market decreased to 3.8 million US dollars, showing a decline of 9.8% compared to the previous week. Safaricom being the dominant player accounted for 48.2% of the total turnover. Interestingly, despite the decrease in market activity, the stock price of Safaricom actually gained 0.4% and reached 13.95 Kenya shillings during the week. The top movers in the market were banking stocks, specifically Equity Group and Cooperative Bank. Equity Group saw a gain of 2.0% and reached 36.50 Kenya shillings, while Cooperative Bank experienced a 0.9% increase and reached 11.35 Kenya shillings. Sunlam was the top gainer of the week, soaring 26.7% week over week to 7.60 Kenya shillings, while Trans Century was the leading laggard, slumping 11.8% week over week to 0.45 Kenya shillings. Foreign investors remained bearish with net outflows of 36.7 thousand US dollars. Equity Group led the selling charge, while KCB Group led the buying charge. Foreign investor participation, however, edged upwards to 63.9% from 61.2% in the prior week. To catch the entire interview, tune in to our digital platforms at TV47 across Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And that is all we had today in stocks and markets. Let's meet next week. My name is Natasha Wairemo.